Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Frank and File Reader. So today I'm talking about chapter five, the final chapter of Communal Luxury by Kristen Ross. If you have missed the other three videos in the series, they will be linked down below. So this chapter is a concluding chapter to the book and therefore it summarizes the major characteristics of the communist anarchist vision of the major communard. Peter Kropotkin, William Morris, and Elisée Reclus. Throughout this book, I have asked myself several times, what do the communards mean about medieval communalism? And I'm thinking that they're referring to monastic communities, like the Benedictines, and then in the 13th century, the mendicants, the Franciscans and the Dominicans in particular. And of course, as they are religious institutions, that goes against what the communards stand for. In this chapter, there is more of a discussion about what makes the Paris Commune different than these visions of communitarianism. So for Peter Kropotkin, the Paris Commune was not a repetition of the 13th century communes. Whereas the 13th century commune was opposed to the Lord, it wasn't opposed to the merchant, the bourgeois merchant, of course. Again, I think that this is why I'm confused while I'm, you know, while I've been reading this book as to what they mean by medieval communitarianism because it depends on which community you look at. There were actually anarchist communities in the Middle Ages of these leaders who had this prophetic vision, um, leaders of peasant communities trying to overthrow the Lord, and they weren't at all interested in collaborating with the merchants. In some cases, actually, they very explicitly abandoned being merchants. So I think about the leader of the Waldensians, which was a mendicant religious community, and he was a former merchant who believed that the Gospels demanded that he give up his career and live in poverty. You have those who aren't kind of part of the establishment, and actually the Waldensians weren't, they were uh, excommunicated, it's very apocalyptic, this belief that Christ was going to return, once the state was overthrown, once all of these power structures were destroyed. Um, and so they had a very radical vision. But then you of course have the, the mendicants who are part of the establishment. And I suppose in that on that side, yes, you do see that they collaborate with merchants, they collaborate with princes. And eventually the friars have this reputation in the late Middle Ages of being very corrupt and mo money hungry and the complete opposite of what, say, Francis of Assisi envisioned for his community. But there were actually anarchist communities that more resembled what Peter Kropotkin and the others are describing here. You know, I, I would have liked to see more of a discussion about these very, very radical uh, communities that were condemned and um, very much like the Paris Commune that were attacked. There were dozens of leaders who were executed. Um, there were massacres. Uh, th there was just a lot of violence towards these kinds of groups. You know, there, there could be more inspiration taken from those communities. If that is what Kropotkin is referencing, again, I would have liked Kristen Ross to bring that out more because I didn't exactly know what these communards meant when they referred to medieval communitarianism. Kropotkin and William Morris really are uh, criticize the isolationist tendencies of these medieval communities. If you're referring to Benedictine communities, they weren't isolationist. Certainly the Franciscans and the Dominicans were not isolationist. But I do appreciate the discussion of isolationism and the dangers of isolationism. So Marx's greatest critique of Russian socialism was its tendency toward isolationism. And this may have been the reason why the Russian communes didn't work and that it led to so many deaths. Elise Reclus had a more nuanced take on isolationism. So on the one hand, he felt that isolationism was inappropriate because he wasn't about just some small communities distancing themselves from an otherwise capitalist bourgeois state. But at the same time, he did feel like we need to focus on the local and that um, production should be on the local level, but that there can also be some distancing from exploitation as you're trying to overcome and destroy this exploitative system. Um, so yeah, he has this more nuanced take 
which I found more sympathetic uh, because, yeah, the isolationism is what I'm concerned about the most. Their valorization of community and, and mutual solidarity is not an ideology, but is just natural. It is really a reflection of what natural selection has opted for in all animal species, including humans. We do naturally desire solidarity and we will naturally want to do what is good for the entire community. Assuming that the structures are such that they don't privilege individualism, over community. I also really liked that the communard did not believe that there is a scarcity of resources in the world, uh, but that there are enough resources in the world for everybody, and the problem is that there are a small number of people, the 1% as we like to say today, who own such a large percentage of the resources. By making sure that people have access to everything equally, that will mean that there isn't this feeling that there is a scarcity and there will be more equality. The problem is that we often think about wage in terms of labor, but as William Morris points out, all labor depends on a wide range of resources and people in previous generations. No one is self-made, you know. I think that that element is very relevant today as we talk about you know, billionaires who have made themselves and they are responsible for all of their wealth. What William Moore says is, no, actually, that's not true at all. There are people in previous generations who have helped this person gain the wealth that they have. Of course, they have workers who have done all of the work so that they have all of this money. And so that's like the reason why they want to eradicate wage labor, because wage labor is based on a lie. It's based on this lie that the money that we receive is in proportion to labor, and, and that isn't true. Not to mention that people who work the hardest in our society don't make the most money. So he wants to eradicate wage labor He completely, which is what distinguishes anarcho-communism from anarchist collectivism, is this eradication of wage labor. Everything is available to all people, the emphasis being on the good in the, of the community and not on the individual. And by shifting focus on the community, humans will naturally want to do what is best for the community. You know, our natural instincts are for mutual solidarity. In this discussion of the community and the community not being this isolated community, but being international and yet local, because production should be on a local level, the communards also propose a view of internationalism that is very different from internationalism at the moment. And they are suggesting that actually by focusing on the local and local production that is common to all, that will lead to an internationalism in that it will topple the state. I thought that was quite paradoxical, but also something to consider that internationalism doesn't mean the transport of products across the ocean, you know, having people in developing countries doing all the labor for the developed nations, um, but that everyone on a local level is producing and are, you know, in solidarity with each other in their community. And because there is no state, they're not at war with other communities, but are really just self-sufficient. I think my only criticism is a criticism that I've had throughout this book, and it's that Kristen Ross assumes that this vision doesn't have its flaws, and also that their reading of science is scientific. At one point in this chapter, Ross talks about how GMOs, genetically modified organisms, biotech organisms as they're called in agricultural science, are dangerous. Um, she just makes this assumption that they're dangerous. She says something along the lines of, we all know today about the dangers of GMOs except I worked in agricultural science and literally there is no evidence that they are dangerous. Not only did I work in agricultural science, but I actually worked in a toxicology lab and knew people who work on biotech technology. Um, and we've literally been telling people this forever. And it's ridiculous to see 
and this is this is my issue with environmentalism today is that it tends to be very anti-scientific and not actually working with scientists um it's not scientific to say that gmos are dangerous it's just neurotic without any kind of basis in science i just wanted to point that out um there is a very interesting scientism in this work and some of it is scientific some of it is worth considering and some of it is just false it's just fear-mongering. I think it would be really nice if political activists would actually work with actual scientists as they keep claiming that they're trying to be pro-science. Anyway, that's the end of my rant. I think that this book was fine. I gave it three out of five stars. I really do want to learn more about the Paris Commune, but I don't think that this book serves as a good introduction to the topic. I was often having to look up on Wikipedia just a broad overview of the events that were just briefly mentioned in this book. Supposedly this is part of a trilogy on the commune, but the way that this book is published, that's not exactly apparent. Kristen Ross really assumes that you have a lot of background knowledge, and hopefully I gave some of that background knowledge in my videos. I would recommend it to anybody who knows something about anarcho-communism, who knows already something about the Paris Commune, there are a lot of really interesting authors that are mentioned here. And I really appreciate all of you for recommending this book and suggesting it for a read along. Um, I know that this is not my most popular series on my channel, but I'm really thankful for all of you who have watched any of my videos. Thank you everybody for watching and I will talk to you later. Bye now.